Can we do cookie reviews after? <laughs> <laughs> what am I naming the class? Priyam, Ki- Priyam Kippur. Sure. Okay, so uh, well, everyone, welcome back. Baruch Hashem. Today is Wednesday night before Yom Kippur. Our plan tonight is to learn a little bit of Gemara and then go into Halachot of Yom Kippur. Mishnah says like this. Yesh choresh telem echad v'chayev alav mishum shmon alav. We are on the chav alav on the bed. Top line. Top line. No, top line, right. Uh, basically 21. One can follow a single. Yeah. So Mishnah is basically saying like this. One can plow a single furrow how do you plow? You have a uh, tool that's called a plow that burrows into the ground and turns it upside down. And you're creating a, a soft ground into which later we're going to throw seeds. That's called sowing. And after some time, uh, the, the plant is going to grow. Whether it's wheat, barley, oats, or rice, it has to be always put, a seed has to be put into the ground. Now, with this Masechta, so far we've been learning about prohibitions and Malkot. And we always said that you could get Malkot for an action, one action, provided that there is Hatra, Warning, and there's witnesses. Right now, Mishnah is going to tell us that you could have one action and get eight malkot on it. Eight different prohibitions. He is plowing one furrow and he's liable on account of eight prohibitions. And he gets eight malkot penalties for each one. Let's see the case. Mishnah says, Hachoresh Bishor Vechamor. Who can translate? Hachoresh Bishor Vechamor. Something Bishor Vechamor. For blind with an ox and a donkey. Yes. You know that there is a prohibition to plow with ox and donkey in the same harness. You're putting them next to each other. And, and, and you plow. So there's different explanations. But it's strange. Mm. Uh, the, one of the most funniest explanations I heard that ox has uh, a digestive, digestive system different than donkey. We know that cow has four stomachs and uh, it al- always regurgitates the food and chews constantly. In other words, it eats grass, grow, grass goes into its big stomach called carrots. Then it it rots in that stomach. It goes into a small stomach, basa posa, which uh, makes it into little balls. Shoots it up into its mouth again, and in the back of the cow's mouth there is big teeth called molars, and they constantly chew this half decayed grass. And then it swallows it again, and then it goes into a stomach called Cava, regular stomach like we do over here with hydrochloric acid that digests, breaks up the food. The reason why cow has to do this is to first spoil the grass because there's bacteria that breaks up the grass. You know, sometimes you walk in the forest, you're hiking, and you see a trunk of the tree fell down. What happened to the trunk of the tree after time? It becomes soft. It becomes, you could step on it and it collapses. Because Hashem created certain bacteria 
that when the tree falls, it starts eating the tree and turning it into dust so that it could become part of the ground again. So grass that has a lot of cellulose and it has to be, be broken down in the stomach of the cow first with that um, bacteria. After it already half chewed up and uh, broken down, it will be further chewed and mixed with uh, some juices in its mouth. And only then it could go into regular stomach like ours and be digested and be broken into nutrients and, and uh, go into different parts of the body. But, but, but a donkey doesn't have that system. Donkey doesn't always chew. It just eats and it goes straight into one stomach like us. So donkey always looks at the cow or the, at the ox next to it and sees that ox is chewing, constantly chewing. As it goes, it's chewing. And the donkey is not chewing. And donkey feel, what is this? This cow always has food and I don't. Someone who is very hungry or is working hard and he has a partner who is eating his food, it's not a fair relationship. So Hashem says, Al tachrosh b'shor v'chamor yachdav. Now, this person who harnessed the donkey and the ox in one harness, he already made one suit. But it doesn't stop there. It so happens to be Vehen Mukdashim, and they are consecrated. They are consecrated for Bet Mikdash. And the Allah is not allowed to use them for regular mundane work. And he is planting wheat in the vineyard, which is prohibited because of Kalayim, because of Shatnes, because of mixing two types. And it's Shvi'it. It's seventh year when you're not allowed to plow. And it's Yom Tov. And it happens to be, let's say, Sukkot. You're not allowed to plow, plow on Sukkot. And he is Kohen. And he is a Nazir in Bet ha Bet Akvarot. In a cemetery. Period. So you see what's happening? We're saying that how could the person plow one furrow and be prohibited in four and in eight different prohibitions? Because it happens to be that it's a cow and a donkey. Prohibition number one. It happens to be that these animals are consecrated. They are given to Bet Mikdash. Once a person, person could consecrate to Bet Mikdash any item. He could consecrate a book. He could consecrate a table, chair. And once he consecrated, he made it holy and gave it to Bet Mikdash, you're not allowed to use this book for yourself. You have to sell it and use the money for Bet Mikdash or use it in Bet Mikdash. Uh, or if it's, if it's food, you're not allowed to eat it. If it's donkey, you're not allowed to ride on it. If it's a cow, you're not allowed to shake it and use it for yourself. So these animals are consecrated. So his second is sur. Second is sur of using something that belongs to Bet Mikdash. Number three, it's Shvi'it. We're not allowed to plow on seventh year. Like it says that the land has to stay barren and rest. And he is sowing, he is planting, he's plowing in order to plant wheat in a vineyard. Now, it doesn't matter that you're not allowed to satchal or tzrak kalayim. You're not allowed to plant kalayim in your field. How do you plant kalayim? Two different types. What is kalayim? Kalayim means mixture of two different types. Oh, it's the fish one. which means uh, crossbreeding, is, uh, prohibit is uh, may be permissible if it's two fruits. You're not allowed to do vegetable and the fruit together. But what is the... Classical case, when you have a vineyard, how does vinagradnik vineyard grow? Vine. Uh, Wine, meaning it goes on top of a frame and then on top of the ground. Anyone who ever saw vinagradnik vines, they're always in there. So you have a whole 
floor empty, free. So maybe you're going to use the space and you're going to plow under the vine, make furrows and, and uh, plant wheat. It's a good idea, but Torah prohibits it. Mm. That's called Klein. So this guy... So you can, you can do anything underneath? Maybe you could plant fruit. But you're not going to be able to plant any fruit because fruit grows on the tall trees. You so, can plant like tomatoes? Tomatoes is a vegetable, Gemara and Brachot says. Anything that's vegetable as a sur with vine, with grape, because it's fruit. It has to be climb. It has to be two different types. And uh, Gemara in Brachot, case of Mubarakim, is, uh, is uh, there's indication there that vegetable and fruit is two different types. But vegetable and vegetable is not is not common. Mm -hmm. Ah, so you could grow a mixture of vegetables. If, since no Gemara says that since vine is fruit, like we say Burepreha eats on grapes, so no vegetables are allowed to right. get in the crop. But if you're growing pumpkin and squash and carrots, you could all then you could, you could do it. Because it all goes in the ground. It's in the ground and it's vegetable. It's right. not plant. But not underneath the vineyard. Not any, no, and it's on lot. Yeah. That's what it means. Don't mix fruit, seeds, and vegetables. vegetables. Yeah. That's the current law today also? Yeah. Mm -hmm. You have to, to redo your garden. Even in the food slaughterhouse. It's made a it's it's not it's not made a right in Kusslar, but it's still suitable in Kusslar. Uh -huh. In Israel they have um, fruits that they've genetically modified to like through grafting <coughs> different processes. They have those. So if it's fruit, they probably used other fruits to yeah. uh, modify, yeah. not vegetables. So that's okay. In fact, I don't know that if there is exists a crossbreed of fruit and vegetable. Okay. I don't think it exists so far. And in fact, Torah doesn't refer to crossbreeding. There is a, is, there is a uh, it's ex by extension, crossbreeding is also pro prohibited. Right. Okay. But Torah is talking about just in the same field, planting right. Right. fruits and vegetables. Right. If, uh, even if you're not crossbreeding uh, in genetics, uh, in the same field is prohibited. But by extension, it's also prohibited uh, to uh, crossbreed because that's clearly why. So now it's like this. It's like this. Uh, it's young. It's it's also Shvi, which is seventh year and not allowed to plow. A whole year now is plow, and it's Yom Tov, where he's not allowed to plow that day. And it's also Kohen in Nazir in Betakvarot, in cemetery. So we will kind of count up Shor Hamor together, Shvi'i, Kalayim, Yom Tov, Kohen, Nazir, So right now I counted only six. Why does Mish say eight? Ox and donkey, maybe? We'll see. We'll, we'll see. Seven. Let me just see over here on the bottom. But it's very unlikely, right? That this is going to happen. It's just possible. It's, just, it's theoretical. It's theoretical. It's just here in order to prove a point. It's like winning a lottery six times in a row. <laughs> no. Look. It's, it's different than winning a lottery because winning a lottery is not up to you. It's chance. Yeah. But you could actually manufacture, you could fashion this scenario by your own deeds. Well, harness in ox and donkey, plow inside the vineyard sowing uh, wheat, on Shvi'id, Chasr Khalil, on Yom Tov, Chasr Khalil. But very unlikely. And when someone sees you, what do you mean unlikely? 
It's all uh, according to your it's desire. Cool. If you want to have, if you want it to happen, it could happen. I mean, you have to be a Kohen also in the beer. Like, in the place of impurity. In the place. Well, how is it impure if uh, it's a uh, wine? Why is uh, planting in the graveyard? <laughs> could it could be even there. one. It could be one burial there. If you, even if you just bury it. So happens to be that they buried somebody there also. Mm. That whole area becomes a. Uh, is it only if it's like a human burial or it's also like if it's animal? No, only only human and only Jewish. Uh, uh, oh, yeah? Vitamin, no? Wow. Okay. Is this a Muslim person? Following with the uh, ox and donkey, one. Uh, both uh, consecrated, two. Uh, both diverse kinds. Okay, plowing with diverse kinds is three. Uh, during sabbatical year, that's four. And it's on a festival, that's five. And he's a priest, that's six. And he's in the zero, that's seven. And it's in an impure place, that's eight. I think the fact that he's priest and Kohen Nazir. and Nazir in impure, it's one. Mm-hmm. Because Kohen and Nazir are not allowed to be in an impure place. So it's really one. So I don't know where the eighth one. No, but he has to be a Kohen and a Nazir. Yeah. So, so it's two separate. Two separate, yeah. But even no, I think we, I counted together with them separate. Yeah, but they're saying both. Meaning, if he was just a Kohen, he would only get one. Just because he's a Kohen and a Nazir, so he's getting one for being Kohen and one for being Nazir. So it's two, I think. Yeah. So they're counting it as two. Accepted. So let's count it again. Ox and donkey. One. Consecrated. Two. Shri'it. Three. Yom Tov. Four. Kohen. Five. Nazir. Diverse kind. Sabbatical year. I counted that. Shemitah. He didn't count that. Crosby. No, he counted the Shri'it. Okay, again. Okay, okay. my mistake. Okay, I missed something. Ox and donkey is one. One. After that, Mishnah. Let's go through Mishnah well, in our language. Mukdashin. From the word. Kadosh consecrated to. Then two different things. He's planting wheat uh, in the vineyard, that's three. three. Then Shvi'it is four. Mm-hmm. Yom Tov is five. Kohen is six. Nazir seven. is seven. Contaminated place, eight. No, contaminated place is not a separate issue. Because Kohen and Nazir are only prohibit, prohibited in contaminated place. Uh, There's no Isur for Kohen to plow. Kohen is allowed to plow. Nazir is allowed yeah, to plow. It's not like you're not allowed to plow. They, they are in contaminated place. That's why they have two Isurim. Yeah, you're right. Both, it says over here in number seven, both Kohen and Nazir are prohibited to contract human corpse to mark concerning Kohen, the Torah states, okay, brings Sukim, okay, Kohen brings Sukim. Thus, when this person plows inside the cemetery, thereby contaminating himself, he transgresses both prohibition. But I, I don't see eight, I'm missing something. Yeah, it doesn't make sense. Okay. Oh, there it continues. Oh. Thus, by entering the cemetery, it's a passing by solution. Then it says, Chananya ben Chananya says, also one who was wearing Kilaim. It is possible to get to yet another, to add yet another prohibition in the case that he plowed while wearing shot nets. Ah. He wants to say that there could be a nine. Eight. That would be eight. 
No, no. The first Manda Omer holds eight. Ah. And Rabbi Hanania, Rabbi Hanania says that transgression is not, uh, that you could have a find another one if he happens to be wear, wearing shatnets. So it's nine. That's why it says over here in that school, it's possible to add a ninth transgression that he was wearing Shatnez garment when he plowed. But they told him, Omrullah, Eino min Hashem. The sages told him, transgression is not the same as nature. Meaning, meaning like this. When a person wears Shatnez, he is not transgressing because he's plowing. He is transgressing because he's wearing shatnets. Mm -hmm. We're trying to find a case where because of his plowing, there will be eight or more, as many as you want. Yeah. I mean, so exactly. in the case where it's short and hamor, it's plowing that's prohibited. Yeah. The fact that they are, they are mugdashin, they are consecrated, it's the plowing that's prohibited. Mm -hmm. The fact that it's yom tov, should we eat? Plowing is prohibited. Yeah, you could be eating non kosher food also. Yeah, but that's not exactly because of plowing. Right. So I have to admit, I don't know um, where the eighth one. I have to look in Perush uh, Mishnayot because I don't see Rashi explaining exactly. Flyer, Bikan, Shweet, Yom Tov, Vukoin, Nazir, Bebeta Tuma. Um, Mishnayot probably will explain it. In the Gemara. Uh, oh, the Gemara I didn't see it either. Let's see Gemara a little bit. Yesh Choresh. We're going to go to two dots. We're going to skip to two dots. Yesh Choresh Teller. So like this. There is a case where one plows a furrow is liable on account of eight prohibition. Amar Rabbi Yana. Rabbi Yana said, at the convention, they voted and decided, one who merely covers seeds of kalayim with earth gets lashes for sowing seeds of kalayim. In other words, what if I put the seeds down in the vineyard and I just cover them with earth? Is that also prohibition or I have to first plow and put it in? So hachofeh, someone that just covers the seeds, is also prohibited. It says over here. There's a chance of them fertilizing. Even if you What's the chidush? Oh, excellent. Well, it's, it's obvious that if you cover them and they're going to go give root because there's a concept of germination. In other words, when the seed gives roots and starts uh, sprouting. So uh, there's a halacha that if I take seeds and I throw them on the ground, open ground, on Shabbat, I basically transgressed sowing on Shabbat. I don't have to first plow it and make it soft. Because there is a chance, that's not for sure, but there is a chance that it's going to germinate. It's going to, it's going to let the roots and it's going to... By the way, the halach is, let's say I throw seeds on the ground, open ground on Shabbat. It's a problem of sowing. But what if I quickly pick them up? It takes three days for the seed to germinate, to give in roots. So if I picked it up before the end of Shabbat, I undid... My prohibition. Or, or after Shabbat. You said three days. Since it takes three days, if you did it after Shabbat, somehow, I think after Shabbat after is too late. Shabbat, after Shabbat, because you already did it on Shabbat. Mm -hmm. Since you did it on Shabbat, and you didn't undo it on Shabbat. Mm -hmm. You can't plan something on Shabbat to do after Shabbat. So I think the, they say, the halacha say that if you picked it up on Shabbat right away, even though it takes three days, but you got to undo it on Shabbat itself. Mm -hmm. Make sure that on Shabbat it would not grow. It would not be able to germinate. But over here we're saying, Someone who just covers it with earth, he gets malkot. So it says over here, 
We're talking about where the mingled seeds would have taken root and grown even without being covered by earth. Otherwise, it would be obvious that covering them constitutes sowing. Regarding what constitutes the essence of active sowing, I see all this um, refreshing. But we're saying that that the Hiddush is that without it, without it, it wouldn't grow. Now that you covered it, it's going to grow. That's why he gets mouthful. Okay. Rabbi Yochanan. Omar Rabbi Yochanan. Rabbi Yochanan told him, Love Mishnah say no Yizu. Isn't this not our Mishnah? Our Mishnah says this. Yes, Chorish tell him, Echoed, Vechai, Valav, Mishum, Shmon, Alavin. There is a case where one plows one furrow and he gets eight prohibitions. Hachoresh, Bishor, Bachamor, Vehen, Mugdoshin, Okilayim, Bikere, Hai Chorish. The Mikhaev Mishum Kalayim when he plows and now he is Chayev because of Kalayim Hechi Meshkachadle. How do we find it? Love the Mikhasi Bahade the Azel. He is covering it as he's going. Why? Because you're not allowed to plant climb but Mishnah says he is plowing plowing is not planting so if Mishnah says that by plowing he is transgressing sowing so it must be that he's not just plowing he is plowing and right away he throws in the seeds we have to say that otherwise it would never be planting Inside the vineyard, because Mishnah said he is plowing, right? And one of the things he's doing, he, he in the vineyard, he is put, putting in seeds. So it must be that he's throwing it in. He's throwing it right on top. So it's, it's the Mishnah says that he is uh, that he is Chaya. Amar lei love the delay la chaspa mimashkachet marganita deta. If I wouldn't uncover the pearl for you, I, I wouldn't the uncover the uh, covering for you, you would never find the pearl under it. In other words, it's good that you told me from the, that it's, uh, there is an indication of that from the Mishnah. But it's only after I said my halacha, you saw it in the Mishnah. If I wouldn't say my halacha, you wouldn't figure it out from the Mishnah because Mishnah is... Very, uh, so to speak, it's very terse. You can't see it so fast. Rabbi Yachanan, Amar Lashlagish, Rabbi Yachanan, Lashlagish said to Rabbi Yachanan, He loved the Kilsa Gavra Rabba. If a great man had not praised you, Hava Aminam at Nisian Mani, I would say differently. If not that the great man, uh, Rabbi Yachanan praised you, I would say differently. I would say that our mission is Rabbi Akiva, the Amar Hamikayim Kalayim Loika. Rabbi Akiva said that even one who just maintains Kalayim gets Malkot. Now, there is, and we're passing like Rabbi Akiva, uh, Rabbi Akiva holds like this, that if you, if a Kalayim, if these two different types, let's say your, uh, your, your wheat grew by itself in your vineyard, if you didn't uproot it early enough, you get Malkot. How could that be? Uh, she didn't do anything. He holds that with not taking out Kalayim is like an action. Oh. Because you constantly take care of your field. And you passing by and you see and you're taking you taking out weed. You're taking out things that don't belong. Because that's called maintaining your field. And you're seeing that 
wheat grew in your vineyard and you don't take it out, you took out all the weed, you took out all the stuff that you don't want because they're not benefiting you, they're hurting you. But wheat that is actually edible and is actually good, you didn't take out. What Torah says not to have, you didn't take out. You only took out the extraneous, the uh, non-usable stuff. So you did a wrong action. You took out the wrong stuff. Maybe you should have left the weed. You should have left all the sarniki, all the stuff that uh, that are hurting your field. And they're just going to diminish the produce. But you should have taken out the, what Torah says not to have. You didn't do that. So it's like you did a Avera. My time with Rabbi Akiva, what's the reason of Rabbi Akiva holds that he just not taking out is already a problem? The Tanya, we learned in the Brayta, Satchal, which is Rakhilayim, your field you should not sow, climb. Ele Ele Zareya, I only know Zareya, sowing, because it says, do not sow climb mixtures in your field. It's only talking about sowing. Mikayim Minayim. From where do I know maintaining is also liable? Talmud Lomar, that's why Torah states, Kelayim Sadcha Lutizra. As Kelayim, you feel not, do not. Meaning, the juxtaposition of the words, Kelayim in your field, no. Kelayim in your field, no. In the case the one is forbidden even to allow climb. So there's two ways to learn. Sadchal Lutizra Kalayim. And then there's just a position, 23. It says, the Torah could have worded the verse more straightforwardly. Behemtecha Kalayim Lutarbiya. By shifting the words Kalayim into juxtaposition with Sadcha, the Torah indicates that we are to read the three words Kalayim Sadcha Lo. Because it says like this, do not crossbreed the animals and do not plant your field with mixed seeds. When we take the last three words of the previous pasuk, crossbreed, no, together with the first word, no, of the next pasuk, then it comes out, kalayim sadcha lo, which means that you should not ever Find field planted with two types. Not what does it mean? Not find, not have. That you should be careful not to allow this to come about. And uh, even by accident. Even by accident. Not but not. The, but the idea is that you should take it away in a timely fashion. Uh -huh. If you didn't take it away, that already malku. That's already malku. So you can't have a field with. Um, Vegetables and fruits? No. You cannot? Unless there are four or more separated. Mishnah in, in Kalayim says it gives you specific measurements how to delineate, how to distinguish oh, one so field or another. There's a requirement like this. Thing, so. it has to, yeah, if it's less, then you have to widen it, yeah. Uh huh. Wow. Let's just say a little bit. Actually, no. I see the Gemara later is, is another topic. We'll stop here. We'll stop here. Uh, as far as this Mishnah, my, my main uh, plan was to learn the Mishnah and to learn the concept only tonight. tonight. The concept that one action could bring eight prohibitions. You know, they said that in Talmud we were able to count things like that, that if I do one action, how many surim do I uh, transgress? Prohibitions I transgress. Chafetz uh, Chaim used to say, first thank you, Baruch HaTad and I went for Shabbat Shalom. Chafetz Chaim, for example, says that the person says one Lashon Hara, because Torah is so 
particular about Lashonara, he transgresses insane amount of um, Surian prohibitions. Can Just husband, l- husband and wife talk Lashonara? What's what else? Only if it contributes to Shalom Bayan. <laughs> Of course not. Yeah, well, not. Unless... Yeah, because husband and wife, they, they like, share a lot of stuff. Together. I think husband and wife are only allowed to talk a lot about their children. Why? Because they're doing it for constructive purposes in order to discipline them. Mm-hmm. But they, but husband and wife, they share like a lot of stuff, right? About what worked, what happened, about this guy, this, that guy. No, no, no. no. Not allowed? So you shouldn't be sharing that stuff. No? In, fa- in fact, it says in, in one safer that a husband who comes home and he tells his wife, oh, at work they uh, didn't respect me here, someone screamed at me, someone was not respectful enough. He's only putting himself down in her eyes. Try to uh, not to share with your wife. Uh, I mean, I'm, I'm asking people, bad people, mostly on the other people did side, to you. On the other side, like the wife likes to share a lot of stuff. That's different. If wife complains, it's uh, to her husband. It's uh, because that's the only so, the only destination for her to come down. Wife is uh, made to uh, complain to her husband. The husband is not made to share or complain or share lashon with his wife. Right. But the, or the wife, uh, she, the only way. She says it not because she only not because she means evil, but just because she needs uh, to come down or to vent it out, to vent. That's all. But man is expected to be more uh, manly and not to have to say it. But the wife is okay. If your wife tells you, manly. you just listen to it. <laughs> I hope I answered that very well. No, uh, not uh, sufficiently. <laughs> Okay, now, Rabotai, Yom Kippur is coming. It says in Shulchan Aruch, Mitzvah leichol be'erev Yom Kippurim. It's mitzvah to eat on Erev Yom Kippur, v'la harbot besuda, and to eat a big suda. Now, we know the Chachamim tell us that it says in the Torah two places. In one place that you have to fast on the 10th of Tishrei. In another place it says that you have to fast on the 9th of Tishrei, ba'erev. One second. We are fasting on the tenth. Why are we calling it ninth? Achonim learn from here because Hashem wants to tell us: anyone who eats on erev Yom Kippur, Hashem considers it as if he fasted on Yom Kippur. In other words, Hashem gives them reward as someone who fasts on Yom Kippur. Awesome. It's so important to Hashem that you should eat on erev Yom Kippur that Hashem is giving you big reward. What? Kind of reward is equal to fasting on Yom Kippur. Now, but it, but it's not. A, is it a big reward to fast on Yom Kippur? It's not a big reward. It's How like, do you? It's like you're obligated to do it. No, well, there is a rule, general rule, that everything is according to pain. The more pain you have in doing a mitzvah, the bigger is the reward. So look what's happening over here. Mm-hmm. Everyone would agree with me that fasting the whole day is painful. Most people, yeah. Yeah, and therefore. If we compare it to eating the whole day, it does, in pain, it doesn't compare. In fact, eating is the most pleasant thing in the world. So what Hashem is doing, He forgo- He changed the general rule. He said, everywhere else, I am going to give reward according to the pain. Over here, I'm eating an Aryan Kippur. I'm going to give a reward that I would otherwise give for pain. I'm going to give for pleasure. Seven reward. It's basically Hashem paying us with bitcoins for a piece of used tissue that um, we just used. That no one wants to buy it. No, it's not. It's not, it's not valuable in Hashem's eyes. If we just have pleasure, and we just uh, we don't put up any effort, Hashem doesn't usually pay with uh, big, big, big bucks over here. He pays for pleasure with the currency that's paid for pain. What does that show us? One thing I always told you about Yom Kippur that's different than Rosh Hashanah 
that it's expression of emotion, love. Jana is head, is uh, cool calculations when we make Hashem king. Yom Kippur, when we cry, we stay in shul all day, we do um, uh, do we hit ourselves on the heart. It's a it's 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 connected live. It's 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 emotions. So just like we go all out for Hashem, we don't go home. We stay in shul. We cry. We say Hashem, my whole life is yours. My whole day is yours. And therefore, we don't make any calculations. We don't hold back. Hashem also, He goes above and beyond. He goes not according to the rules. He goes. Uh, suspends the rules, normal rules, and he gives us a reward. The whole day of Yom Kippur, he gives us a huge reward as if we're eating. The normal rules don't apply anymore. On Erev Yom Kippur, we don't say Tachanun, it's Yom Tov. Now, over here, we come to a very, very important concept, which is also connected to Sudam of Seket. Sudam of Seket is the last Suda before Yom Kippur. Uh, there's a question, is Yom Kippur a happy day or... Suda is like a mourner's Suda? Um, no, Mavseket means just the last Suda before... Mavseket means the ending Suda that starts the fast. Mm-hmm. The Suda that before the fast. And usually this Suda, Mavseket, is... Every, the whole family gets together, you eat it, uh, and you already try to, by then, go to Mikvah, by then, Davan Mincha, by then, get Malko. Everything is done. We're going to get to all these things. But now everything is just set for Yom Kippur. And now, just eating the Suda, and then you're going straight into Yom Kippur. So, this Suda, one second, uh, there's a question Is it Sudat Mitzvah or no? You know that there is a concept of Sudat Mitzvah. Sudat, it's Mitzvah to eat it. So, Rabbeinu Yonah says that this Sudam of Seket is one of the biggest Sudat. Why? Because there's actually three reasons why we eat this Sudat. Reason number one, we eat it, very simple reason, so that we could fast. Reason number two, we eat it because it's Sudat Mitzvah, just like we make always a Sudat when there is a big occasion. For example, a person gets married, right? It's a Mitzvah. There's always a soda, always a meal by wedding. Pidyana, uh, bar mitzvah, always a meal. Brit milah, always a meal. Pidyana ben, always a meal. Uh, why? My Rebbe explained, Rebbe that's all, that mitzvah, that soda, meal, gives importance to the mitzvah, shows that we treasure we cherish the mitzvah. If we would just do mitzvah, you could do Brit Milah even without Suda. You could get married without Suda. You could uh, do Pidyan Aben without Suda. Bar Mitzvah, a person is Bar Mitzvah without Suda. But why do we make Suda? Every, all Jewish people are unanimous on this. There gotta be Suda. I don't care. The best catering, look at Bukhari weddings, look at Bukhari Bar Mitzvah, look at Bukhari Brit Milah, <laughs> right? Uh, so, what is this? There's no uh, about it. So that, why? Because traditionally, we, uh, it's ingrained in us that we highlight the mitzvah. We use the mitzvah to make the suda, and we use the suda to uh, give mitzvah a special place in our life. It's not just a regular thing. A celebration of the mitzvah, it's a celebration because of the mitzvah. Right. So, Rabbi Yonah says that on Erev Yom Kippur, because on Yom Kippur at night Hashem is going to forgive our Avirot, this is considered to be like a wedding, it's considered to be like Bar Mitzvah, it's considered like Pidyon Ben, like Brit Milah. It's a huge event in itself in our lives, it's a huge milestone in our lives. So we, all the Jewish people, they do a big mitzvah, simcha, as a simcha that Hashem forgives our Aviru. So that's already the second reason why we have this Suda. First one is because we need to fast. Second one is because it's an event, like 
wedding, like Bar Mitzvah. And the third one, Rabbi Yonah says that really Yom Kippur is a holiday. And it's called Shabbat Shabbaton. It's like Shabbat of all Shabbats. But and it's really we're supposed to eat suda on Yom Kippur, but Hashem said to fast, we cannot eat. So we eat two suda before Yom Kippur. We say eat one in the morning and one uh, in the afternoon, suda of second, and one after Yom Kippur is over. So at the end, we end up eating three suda, just like regular Shabbat. Mm. So it becomes suda Shabbat also. So, if so, then this Suda before Yom Kippur has in it, it's unlike any other Suda of the year, it has in, in it all the advantages and all the special reasons to have Suda. Like a two day Yom Tov. It's today, it stretches over two days with a. Well, actually, yeah. three days. Yeah. Every Yom Kippur is like Yom Tov almost. It stretches over three days, actually. Or oh, the next day? Why three days? Friday is uh, Arab Shabbat. No, but it stretches over three days. Oh, oh really? uh, Arab Shabbat. Because it's Wednesday, Thursday, and Friday. So, so Thursday comes night, in Monday Friday. night? Thursday night. So God Friday. comes in Monday night, right? Well, so that's, that was Monday night. That's when you have your suit to Shabbat Shlishi. So yeah, it makes Friday also. Look, we're going to have uh, Yom Kippur, like three long days long. Yom Tov, that oh, Friday. Long. Well, that's Shabbat, that's market, Sunday, well, that's Shabbat, that's Monday night, Friday morning. One after another. This year, because the only of them are Rosh Hashanah, Kippur, they, and Sukkot, they're in the middle of the week. So we're going to have one after with one day or two big days break, we're going to go into the Yom Tov again. So that's why we are above and beyond all the other nations as far as holidays. <laughs> We, uh, we have uh, we know how to party. That's I just that's not what I wanted to say. Okay, now it says like this: we have to make sure that we are we settle our accounts with any person that we may owe money to or or. I'm sorry to apologize, or we may think that someone we slighted somebody. That's why it says it's a special seif in the Shulchan Aruch that says um, that a person must ask for forgiveness from the person he might have offended, and if he didn't forgive you, you have to go back to him again and again three times. And if he didn't forgive you after you went three times, then you don't have to go anymore. Besides for your Rebbe. Rebbe, you have to go until he forgives you, even a thousand times. Okay? Now, then it says that if someone asks you for forgiveness, even if you don't feel like, you should forgive him. There's even like a new video from Yoel Gold, I don't know if you saw, that there was a couple getting married in Israel. And all of a sudden, in the middle of their wedding, police storms into their wedding, tells all the guests to get out, gives Khatan side and Kala side 5,000 shekel fine, gets everyone to go home. The Khatan and Kala are shocked. They don't know what hit them. They went home. There was no Sheva uh, Brachot, there was no much, not much dancing, nothing. Okay, they were happy that they were at least married together. Then, like a year later, before Yom Kippur, someone calls them, the friend of the Khatan, and tells them, he's very sorry, because really, he was the one who called the police. He was afraid that people are going to get sick at the wedding, this was in the middle of COVID, and he called the police. And uh, since then, he didn't get even one shidduch. He thought that he's doing a mitzvah, that he called police. <laughs> he didn't get one shidduch. He's only 24. He can't get married. He feels that it's because he ruined the wedding. So they didn't want to forgive him at first. They were so upset. Eventually, overnight, they thought about it. It took some time the pain to go away, then eventually it was already Arab Yom Kippur. 
So they called him back. They said, okay, they walk, talk, to, talk to each other, husband and wife. And they said, okay, we'll forgive you. Okay. So you see that... He's, he's selfish on all levels. Even the forgiveness was selfish. Really. Yeah. <laughs> Rabbi, does he have to pay them back on the money they wasted on the wedding? No, no, because it's grammar. You only pay back if you actively damage them. What do you mean? Uh, actively? No, he called the police. The police the decided what to do. What do you mean? You know that when the police come, they're going to give you a fine. Oh, they didn't have to raid the place and kick everyone out. No, you know whenever because of COVID, they're always finding everyone. He so doesn't have to. He doesn't. It's a, there is a concept that you don't have to pay in Bedin. Bedin cannot obligate you because we didn't have very strict rules something which you did not damage with your action you don't pay but be they shamayim mm. but in shamayim they definitely consider you liable and you have to on your own you have to give the money if you decide not to okay you can wait until you get to the the but the other one. No, but like other some spends a hundred thousand dollars on a wedding like it's a Bukharian wedding right and then someone comes and ruins their wedding like that, you know, like... Go for a break for half an hour and call everybody back in half an hour. Yeah, but... I've seen Clark do that in Queens on the... And they got fined so many times and they no, saw no, that... No, no, Cops <laughs> come, yeah, hi, bye, that's it, okay. Really? Like, he came out, back, yeah. he came back. This one, but this was in Israel. This one was maybe different over there, you know? Yeah, this is a little different. Story. America is... <laughs> wow, that's scary. Uh, Listen, it shouldn't uh, ever happen again because this was a very scary time, a crazy time. Now, what an example from uh, Hasidic people in the uh, board park. They do it in the basement with the windows, doors closed. Have a good day, you hear, that's it. Nobody comes in, no cops come in, nobody comes in. Okay, Rabbi let's just quickly review the Isurim, five prohibitions of, the, of, of Yom Kippur. What are the five prohibitions of Yom Kippur? One is eating and drinking. Number two is washing your hands. Number three is smearing your hands with oils or creams. Washing your hands, you're allowed to wash, right? Up to the knuckles? We're going to get back to the details. Yes, you're allowed to. Number Four is uh, a number. No, we did already number four. And number th- five is Tashmish Amita, to live with your wife. Okay. Now, let's go back to each one of them. Eating and drinking. Eating and drinking is Isur Karet. All the others are Midrabana. So, uh, therefore, it's very... Uh, stringent. Take certain like medications. They can drink with someone else. So uh, it's a question that needs to be answered in the very great detail. I would have to ask you what medication for which condition. Let's say for example. What did the doctor say? It's 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 a process like this. You first have to have an actual condition. Then you have to ask a doctor specific question. On Yom Kippur, if I don't take it, what's going to be? Depending on doctor, also has to. He doesn't decide generically. He has to decide for your specific condition. Where are you uh, right now in progression of the sickness? And then he has to give his medical uh, decision. Then you have to go to a rabbi, tell him all of this, and then the rabbi tells you. So it's not it's the question like this are good. But the question of these are not answerable because you need much more detail. Each one is individual. Every case is individual. Are you allowed to use mouthwash on people? No. You wash water? No. Because maybe you'll swallow. In fact, there is a general rule that on any public fast, you're not allowed to wash, rinse your, water, your mouth with water. Maybe you'll swallow a little bit of water. Now, it doesn't happen. I mean, I try to. I, I, I mean, every time I wash out, I never swallow it. But Allah is Allah. The rabbi is prohibited. Plus. Huh? Plus. Plus is not a problem. That's Allah, that you can. You cannot wash out your mouth on the public fast. Yom Kippur for sure. No, Yom Kippur for sure. But the other fast, I thought it was not a problem. No, any public fast. Now, if it's an individual fast. No, public fast. Public fast, you know. It's Allah, I'll find it for you. 
It's a it's a Farty Falafa. It's Farty Falafa. Yes. What if uh, I take a medication and it's side effects very dry mouth? That's what I take. Oh, it's still not allowed. I mean, uh, it depends on uh, if you're gonna if it's because the only thing is if it's because nefesh, but. Just because your, your mouth is dry, there's a lot of things. Many people are manifesting their mouth is dry. We don't allow it. You're not allowed to rinse your mouth, like after the uh, second half or something? I thought there was... On Yom Kippur? Not on Yom Kippur, like on the other fast. Yeah? You sure? Sure. I heard, I feel like it's... Maybe you're allowed to rinse out your mouth with Listerine that is non-edible. Um, not on Yom Kippur. Not on Yom Kippur, yeah. On other fasts, the Riza Shita may be. I, I, when I was learning this, I felt my Rebbe didn't allow, doesn't allow didn't allow even the stirring because he holds that it's still edible. They they, they put enough sugar in their syrup, but if but there are, but I think there are there's at least one point one plus three called. Water for sure. Not edible. But swallowing is like there's a limit to how much you could swallow it and if you shouldn't swallow. Right? Like saliva you could swallow also not a problem. Right. Because it's already in your mouth. It's not something outside goes into your mouth. Right. But over here something outside. Water goes into your mouth. But and you if you swallow it, you broke your fast. No, but is there a limit, no? Isn't there a limit? What do you mean limit? Yeah, like a couple of ounces or something. No, there's no limit. It does not say that. You could drink less than a certain no, shield. You couldn't drink it, but if it's accidentally. No, it doesn't say that. Okay. Now, so having finished the halacha of, uh, <coughs> of eating and drinking, let's go to washing. It says you're not allowed to wash. However, this is only if you're washing for pleasure. But if you're washing off dirt, then you could wash as much as you need. So let's say your whole hand became dirty with mud. You're allowed to wash it off because the sort of washing is for ta'anuk. Let's say uh, warm water or even cold water, you're washing your hands to feel clean. To feel clean from when you're already clean. Because all washing, by definition, is is uh, is uh, pleasure. But washing out dirt, it's not pleasure; it's necessity. So therefore, you're allowed. How do we wash our hands in the morning? Just like Nerik said, till the knuckles, and you're allowed to say bracha on Uh Any time, person, he maybe he picked his nose, he touched something dirty. He's allowed to wash his hands too, from that dirt. Okay. The rest will skip. Now, even the woman that wants to go to Mikvah, and she's not allowed to go to Mikvah, on Yom Kippur. The person who, who became Baal Keri, the seed came out from him, is not allowed to go to Mikvah or Tiksha on Yom Kippur. Okay. Now, as far as um, smearing, one is not allowed to smear even a small part of his body. Even if it's to remove sweat. Smearing is what? In olden days, for the order and purposes, they used oils, threatening oils. Mm -hmm. So they used to cover themselves with oil. And it was such a commonly used practice that even if, if they did it, didn't do it one day, mm -hmm. They didn't feel comfortable. So it's considered to be pleasure. Today we don't do it. Um, now, are you allowed to stick, are you allowed to use the stick? That's smearing. Some say that deodorant is about deodorant. Some say deodorant is okay because it's liquid, and as soon as it touches your body, it dries up. Others say that no, even deodorant is also. Really? 
all of a sudden, a young, a young, it's, it's going to stop by the time we're finished. Allah Chodim Yom Kippur is going to stop. Okay. Oh, that, now I remember what I skipped because um, wearing leather shoes is included in the halachot of smearing. So there's a whole question, how much of the shoe has, has to be leather? Bel- the belt is fine? belt is fine, the jacket is fine, the hat is fine, everything is fine besides the shoes. Leather shoes only. Sneakers are fine. No, if it's leather, leather, no. No, sneakers are not leather. If they're not. If they're not. Belt arrows is fine. Belt is fine. Yeah. Now it says like this: um, If a person is uh, in the place where there is scorpions, he's allowed to wear shoes, leather shoes. Well, it's not applicable to us. Um, a woman that just gave birth for thirty days allowed to wear shoes. Uh, any person who is sick is allowed to wear shoes. He doesn't have to be sick with terminal or uh, life-threatening illness. That's, that's the way Chachamim said it. Since le- we- we- wearing leather is Midrabanan, they allowed it for a sick person. Tashmi Shamita, one is not allowed to be with his wife. That's why some people even light a candle because there's halacha that one is not allowed to have or intercourse where there is light, so they leave a light on a candle in the bedroom, so that they will never want to be with them. Okay. Now, there's a question about children, or someone under bar mitzvah. We're gonna skip it, it's for later when you're gonna, the children are gonna be a little older. We're gonna do, do that. How, it's machloke, how much under bar mitzvah fast. And uh, we know that here, this is what I was talking about. Then I rinse my mouth and brush my teeth. When? Chabad the door. In general, one should refrain from r- rinsing his mouth or brushing his teeth on a fast. That if not doing so will cause one significant pain and discomfort, he may do so provided that he does not swallow. This leading is the only place to the minor fast. Twelve. Okay. I don't know the, where it said. Now, Oh yeah, twelve. Uh, now, I mean, I it says feel uncomfortable. it says over here that if you feel extremely uncomfortable, the Allah is that you're not allowed to. If you feel extremely uncomfortable, you're allowed to. So um, I don't think by us. I think we're a grown man. I think we could be. <laughs> I feel very uncomfortable <laughs> when I have to be amongst people. I feel very uncomfortable. Okay. So, no. No, 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 it doesn't say that you have to protect others. Moscow, you have to feel uncomfortable. Moscow, the, 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 the Just because you... I feel very uncomfortable. If it's like so psychological, no. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> now, Rabbi, you know that on Yom Kippur, we read Sefer Yonah. And I'm going to conclude with this. Question is, why did Chacham? By the way, Sefer Yonah is considered to be like this once a year big, big kavod to buy it. Why is it such a big book? Or why is it such a big thing? Besides for it being a complete story from A to Z that we read on the, on, in one sitting, but it tells a story about Yonah, who Hashem told him to prophesy to the city of Nineveh that they are going to be destroyed. If they don't do tshuva, and Yonah did not want to do it, they did not want to do what Hashem wanted to say. And the reason why he didn't want to do it because he knew that the goyim were going to do tshuva right away, and that's going to cast bad light on Jews. The Jews don't do tshuva right away, so he tried to run away from Hashem. He took, he went, took a train, uh, not train, ship outside of Israel. But as the story goes, Hashem started a whole storm. Uh, the, the sailors didn't know what's happening. It uncovered that Yonah was causing it. They threw him into the ocean. The fish swallowed it. The whale swallowed it. He lived in the whale's stomach. And then the whale spit him out. And eventually, Yonah figured out that 
he cannot run away from Hashem. And he won and he did what Hashem said at the end. So Chacham said, decided like this. They said that we're going to read this book on Yom Kippur. Because sometimes a person says like this. Okay, on Yom Kippur Hashem forgives my everybody. But that's only if I do tshuva. And I have to change. I have to become a different person. Oh. It's so difficult for me to become a different person. It's easier to go to Gehenna than to uh, become a different person. Let me just continue with my Avedo because I just can't do it. In Sefer Yonah, this fact that fish swallowed him and then he went back and he was swallowed a few times by two fishes. It shows you that we could come back to life, go back to death and come back to life. It's called Gilgu. It's reincarnation. And it shows you that Hashem will be on your back even if you have to come back to life again and again and again until you become a good person. So, but it doesn't mean that, uh, like, you have to become, like, fully observant, right? That doesn't mean that. I don't know what you mean here. You're coming back to just fix whatever your problem was, right? To me, you know, Hashem gave six hundred twenty this world, right? But the way I understand it, according to Ramchal, Rabbi Moshe Chaim Satan. Because, because I, I'm just, I would say that there's so many people that are like fully observant, you know, why would Hashem send them here? They're completely observant, they do all mitzvot, you know? First of all, maybe in previous life they were not observant. That's why they're observant now, right. which is so, good. So, so, yeah, so, so Hashem sends them here just to perfect whatever they were not, you know, doing properly in, in the previous life. That's what, I, that's what my understanding But the only way, look, the only way to really know what is it that I have to perfect, because we don't know, it's not like Hashem gives us a small little instructions on the side, right? To right. see. So the only way to really know is to, to keep the whole Torah. Because you can't pick and choose. You have to do the whole thing, hoping that the thing that you have to fix is one of those that you, that Hashem gave. Simple logic. Yeah, but it's like sometimes you know what your weaknesses are, right? What your character flaws are. You, you know, know that, that you want to try to, you know, fix that. That's true. But if, let's say you, you fix that, but, on, but meanwhile you, you make out of your own, you don't, you don't keep out so that you are giving, making yourself a disservice. You're going to have to, okay, you fix this, but you're going to come back, have to come back because of the other thing. This rabbi one time said in the Shior, they were going to, uh, that for people, it, it can be easy to do a mitzvot, to do Shabbat and all that. But the most important thing what God cares more before the Torah is humility. Not only that, you have to midot. There is a difference between just rituals and midot tovot, meaning kindness, respect, soft, spoken person. So, uh, respecting others. It says that uh, one midah is hard to fix. You could finish shas easier or do all six times in this world than to, to fix one midah. That you have to work on. So, uh, you're right. So, humility is one of the mid- Humility is only one of the midahs. Humility is one of the midahs. Like water. Um. Humility is a very nice midah. It's one of the... It's hard to achieve it. It's hard to achieve it. <sighs> okay. So that's what we read Sefer Yana. Now, when we, we pray Aravit and we say Havdalah, we have to make Bracha Borebriagefen without Besamim. But Nair is funny. It's only if it was burning the whole Yom Kippur. Hmm. Why? We can light after? You cannot just light a can, uh, like a match, like a Tashgalka, 
and light a candle. It has to be ner shishavat, ner that was around during the Yom Kippur. Otherwise, does it have to be with uh, two weeks, or it could be like a regular candle, and you light the candle with twenty-four hours. Twenty-six hours. Candle with no, a regular candle is gonna is not enough. You had need twenty-four hours no, in order to that's light it before saying, you. Like, can we have a, a, a like a twenty-four hour candle, like a one-day candle lit prior to uh, a, a Yom Kippur? Yom Kippur? And then just light from that candle, or use, no, we can't use that candle for Abdallah. So it has one from candle. that candle, you light the regular Abdallah. Yeah. Or many Abdallah candles. Or another candle, and uh, light another candle. Or if you don't have it, then there's no nair, no business. Yes, but if you don't have it, you just make Rebri Agefen and Amabdil. Amabdil. For the Okay. And after Yom Kippur, there is a mitzvah to do something for. Sukkot, for Sukkah. And always there is uh, uh, to save the moon, blessing. And uh, also Bechata Olavana. Bechata yeah. Olavana. may it be a good year for all of us. May the Chag Sukkot be real Simcha, yeah. dancing with the Torah, rejoicing. And we should take this Simcha into, by the way, why is the most happy uh, Chag, Sukkot, is after Yom Kippur. To bring our spirits up? No. Because we shall forgive our sins. Because the biggest Simcha uh, could only be possible once you don't have any sins. That, that's the biggest Simcha. Uh, You're coming close? We have to use the door coming up. When? Yom Kippur? Yeah. No, we're going to be in prison. You're going to miss the three sword door. <laughs> Three days. Придешь ко мне? Ну, если ты придешь, поселишься в Нарио. У меня в одну в Нарио. Ну, это три дня. Это Wednesday evening to uh, Thursday. Starts Wednesday morning. You first do that. Утром надо кушать булочку с медом, да? That's the most important part. Булочку с медом. You know, I didn't eat uh, honey except with my uh, tea after a show. You like honey? I love honey. What do you think? I need sugar, but I need sugar. Do you have all the yogurt? No, no. I don't know. It's tough. Not yet? I don't hear it. Did you stop it? Uh, we'll we'll right, right. Coming oh. out, I sure won't stop it, don't worry. <sighs> Thank, Thank you very much, guys, for being here. Uh, you Wednesday you morning. Let's take a hug. We're going to have well, more well, people that weren't... I count, and on the, on the spreadsheet that I I, I marked now who registered for it before. So more so people. 14 right? people. 14 people. Still not. Look, my son is not going to be there, so I'm not going to be there. But three other people are coming. Okay. We have a process. Kamarot, uh, uh, you're only going to do this in the, uh, uh, Wednesday morning? Yeah, I, I only have that one slot, hour and a half. From five to six thirty. So what are you doing with the chicken? So I, I shecht. I shecht. I want to. I want to do with the chicken, but uh, not so, so early. Do it on the morning. Have you shecht? Nice. I've been doing it for a few years. Where in the shul, where the rabbi invites me. I guess. The Everything biggest. The best. Which rabbi? Everything's best. Oh, it's amazing. Oh, it's amazing. Nick, it's after the meal. Я договорился с этим Брэндоном Гоем, он поможет мне поставить все. Но если каким-то причинам, он такой, я на него полагаться не могу. Может, Рошана, его один день вообще не было. Если вдруг я его не найду, мне нужно же будет этот, этот армкодыш из той комнаты, с кухни, куда ждать. Я могу тебе позвонить? Ну, позвони, я. Но я приеду в 6 утра. Это Okay, so I'll no. I made up with him. I'm not gonna be home. I'm not gonna be home. I'm gonna be in New York. So if I don't get it by by six, then I'll call you at six. But I should okay. be able to get it. Okay, no I see what you mean. Wait, tomorrow? Yeah, tomorrow. Yeah, tomorrow is done. Okay. Right. Most likely. Bye right. bye. Worst case scenario for your show. You want to publicize it? For my show. What do you mean? Should I say now? No, that's fine. Let me make sure. Rabbi, join us. 
and Northern Avenue, 2884, Yeshiva or Beacon for uh, Yom Kippur prayers. That's it. Are you editing?